Right. Uh, well, <laughs> this is our third. This is our third week. So hopefully the whole story will be told uh, in this week. Uh, I'll go over hashing again, and then uh, we'll look at digital certificates. One of the worst areas of certificates, PKI, a disaster area. Uh, few people understand really what it is, but it actually protects data, identity, uh, integrity, and, and, and so on. So, so we're tr trying to understand it, uh, and uh, we're just gobsmacked the, the level of understanding. We want to get past the understanding of the acronyms. I appreciate I've got lost there. <laughs> But there's no way we can get we can get by them. Okay, so we'll try and understand. Hopefully, you've understood public key, private key, uh, and and hashing methods. Uh, I, I'll give you a heads up on on what's going to be in the test uh, and some mock tests that you can actually take. But for just now, we're really trying to understand uh, the the main methods involved. Okay, so this was the this was. Uh, this is our MD5, uh, which is really the, the, the core of many systems, but, but really it's, it's time has passed. It's finished, uh, and it's not really credible in any sort of investigation, but it's still used. <laughs> it's still used in law enforcement. You wouldn't believe the number of images that are still MD5 uh, ready. You can't find the original image, so they're still using MD5, which is a bit, a bit strange when you think that it is possible to create a collision for a valid piece of content. So as we've seen last week, I can produce two images with the same hash uh, signature by stuffing, stuffing bytes into them. Okay, so there's, the, there's our hashes there. They're fixed length. It doesn't matter how much data that we've got. They always come out the same. And we typically use our base64, base64, or our, our hex, uh, <coughs> our hex, uh, strings. Okay, we change one bit and completely changes. This causes a bit of a problem. Uh, if you've got time today, go along and see Phil Penrose's uh, presentation at three o'clock and see some of the research that we've been doing. But Phil's been looking at similarity hashes. Similarity hashes is that if I change a little bit of the data, I can actually tell that that was roughly the same hash as before. And here's the, the, the new one. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't give a nice sort of a, a fixed length. The hash will, will grow, obviously, because it has a lot more data to, to store. Okay, so that's where we are just now. And we're using the lab uh, OpenSSL, and we'll use uh, John the Ripper and Hashcat. Okay, Hashcat <laughs> timed out on our Kali, so just roll back the clock on the instance today. <laughs> Before Christmas, <laughs> and uh, and everything will be fine. We'll get we'll get an update uh, for your Kali instance to be able to, to run it. Okay, so so that's that's what we use, and we use it all over the place. We'll be looking at Tripwire tomorrow <laughs> in another module, and Tripwire uh, looks at hashing all the files, and then having a look to see when the hashes change, and then you would even get a text message sent to you to see as file has been changed now in the server. It doesn't look very good. Okay, so the integrity that we get is, is really built around taking these, these hash signatures. And we see it all over the place. In our digital search, we see a thumbprint, and the thumbprint will actually define if the certificate has been changed uh, <coughs> or, or, or not. Okay, in Windows, we see it within the LM hash and the NT hash. Uh, there's a bit of story to, to these. If you've got some time, have a look at the Python lab that we've got in that. But LM hash is really one of the weakest hashes around. Uh, NT hash was a little bit better, uh, but now Windows will properly encrypt the, um, uh, the, the passwords. So it's not quite as easy as it used to be. On a Cisco router, on fact, in, on Cisco devices, you'll see a config such as this. Uh, this number here actually identifies the hashing method, and that's, that's uh, a good old MD5, oh, yuck. <laughs> uh, there's no salt, the, the salt is in here, as we've seen before. If you have a little look in there, try to develop your eye uh, to pick off the, the dollar signs uh, in, in there, because uh, the dollar signs are showing you the type 
of the hash. It's a bit difficult to see that now. <laughs> the type of the hash is the first field. So this field here is the type. The second part is the salt. And then the last part is the hash. So at least I've got salts in there. Uh, but really, uh, it's MD5 isn't too difficult uh, to, to, to crack, even with, the, even with the salt, if you've used a dictionary type word. Okay, so this is the problem that we have. So either an intruder can use brute force. Brute force, they will keep trying, keep trying lots of, lots of passwords until they find one. Or much quicker, they'll use a rainbow table and the rainbow table will pre-cook the hashes. And then all we have to do is to be able to look up uh, the value to be able to map it back uh, to them. So really, you've got to say that, that, that hashing, is, hashing of passwords is extremely flawed, <laughs> an extremely flawed way of, uh, of storing our passwords. OK, so that's what we looked at. So there's the, there's the top 10 uh, Adobe passwords. Two million people selected one, two, three, four, five, six. And there was no salting involved. It was purely just a one hash. So once the intruders had cracked one of those passwords, which wasn't too difficult, they had cracked two million at the same time. So make sure that, uh, that salt was actually used. So there's one question I got in the lab. Uh, does any, see, when we're when we're encrypting, does anybody know where the salt went? When we were using AES in the lab, does anybody know what, what, what the salt actually was? See, see when you looked, at your, you looked at your encrypted value, it, it said salt. Do you know what that is? When you looked at it in its core format, it said salt. And every time you encrypted, you got a new, you got a new cipher. Is that right? Yeah, every single time. So it was salted. Does anybody know what that salt value actually was? Could be. That's a good. That's a very good answer. It's the IV. It's the initialization vector. Okay. If I lose my IV, if I use the my initialization vector, can I? Can I? Can I? Can I unencrypt? If I went and deleted the initialization vector, or the the salt within the encrypted message that I, that I send you, can you can you decrypt that? Not really. <laughs> okay, so the IV has got to go along with the salt. It's got to go. We call it salt here, but in, in exception, it's a it's an initialization vector. It's a random number. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Randomness isn't quite as random as you actually think. So don't think just because you've selected a random number that somebody can't guess your idea about the mouse movements is good, but it takes a while to do that. So randomness isn't quite as good. If I can guess roughly, when you click the button, I could guess what your random number was because I've got a random generator that runs the same as you. I just have to guess how long it took you to actually create the random number, and, and it's there. OK, and this is the problem that we've got. Most people, <laughs> me included probably, most people won't change their passwords for the different systems. So if one system is hacked, then an intruder will then jump off and go to other accounts uh, fr from there. If you're really in a highly secure uh, environment, don't use passwords as the only form of authentication. Use an out-of-band message method, such as getting a, 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 a number on your, on your mobile phone and then putting it in. So what I mean, what I mean by out-of-band, why is that out-of-band Why is that out of band authentication? Yeah. In addition to the That's right. So it's using a different communication channel. And it's using a different mechanism uh, to do it. So always in, in a secure environment, use multi-factor uh, and, and make sure that you're using uh, uh, other methods. Hello. OK, so we had a quick look to see. And it was quite disappointing <laughs> that uh, how easy it was. Uh, Eight digits, e e easily, easily crackable, even with any character. 
10 digits is probably where we, sh where we should be. Uh, but anything in a standard dictionary up to 10 is probably gone, gone too. Uh, your email address, for example. Uh, but on on the GPU uh, on the Amazon Cloud, you can rent GPUs, which are just the NVIDIA cards that you get. So you can rent them, and you can have several of them together. Each one of those has four thousand processors. You can get the highly optimized crackers uh, that only do hashing uh, methods. So a hundred billion is probably a quite a good a good guess. For the Bitcoin miners, you're up to Terra hashes. Terra. That's Terra. That's a... <laughs> I can't even think. That's, so a billion is a thousand million. So Terra is a thousand thousand million. Uh, that, that's a lot of, lot of hashes. Uh, so the computing power is, is, is there. And if I really want, I, I, I can use a supercomputer. I can use I, the, one of the big IBM... Uh, blue jean computers. Does that answer your question? And that is, that if like, someone's going to hack your email, what can you just have your, like, your email address and then just comparing them? Okay, so, so it depends whether you're inside or outside. If you're inside, you could, you could grab the, uh, the, the post office and, and take that off. Uh, you could get the, the hash table of passwords from, from Windows, say, from the Windows Domain Controller. You get that off, and that contains a list of usernames. And uh, so PW uh, dump is a standard format that we'll see today. And that has a username and the ID and the hashed password. And then somebody just c computes. In the Ashley Madison one, uh, I think a standard PC broke 2 million passwords in an instance because they hadn't used bcrypt. As I said last week, if I did a password, and not me, <laughs> if I did a password reset, the coder forgot to put bcrypt in there. So I, when I reset my password, it went back to the original hashing method. Uh, so they didn't need any complicated uh, hardware. Uh, so really, in most cases, the passwords, if, if an intruder gets hold of the hashed table, then it's, it, it, it's gone. <coughs> and it's inside, our, it's inside our threats all the time because the firewalls and all the network devices are, are monitoring for any sort of external uh, attack. So the intruder gets into the network and is inside and waits there uh, and, and then really focuses on, on things. Okay, so we looked at the, the different methods. So I highlight, I highlight bcrypt there. Really, if you can, implement bcrypt. It's a great method. Uh, SHA-3 is the new SHA method that doesn't depend on the methodology that was used for SHA-1. Just in case tomorrow we wake up and SHA-1 has been cracked uh, with its method, then there's another one just sitting on the shelf waiting to be used. But we've seen a lot of companies using SHA-3 as a, as a, as a new method uh, in there. There's a whole lot of other ones, the LMHash, Tiger, and the, uh, this one here. Okay, so we use it, uh, we typically use a salt and a password. That would generate uh, a key for us. The key is a hash, okay? You can't expect a user to remember an encryption key. So how are you going to generate your encryption key? The way you normally do it is that you have a password. Uh, this is when we're encrypting this. We have some salt, and then the salt and the password go together to produce a hash. The hash becomes the encryption key. The encryption key, uh, in this case, uh, takes, all, takes the key that you're going to use to encrypt the disk and encrypts it. Okay, so we normally, on an encrypted disk, have a header file. The header file contains the key for the disk, normally AES, uh, in there. And this, this hash here is used to generate uh, the, the key from it. 
I'll explain why we use PBKDF, <laughs> PBKDF2. Okay, you use it in web, you using it all the time. Uh, it's it's there, and it's it's my God, is it slow? <laughs> it's as slow as you can get. It just takes a long time. So why why am I using a slow function like that? That that doesn't seem quite right. Why are we in this case? using PBKDF2. It's slow, yeah. As long as it's acceptable for us, it takes half a second or so to, to create our key for us. For an intruder, that's a nightmare because to check uh, a, a billion uh, keys is going to take them many lifetimes then. Okay, so we often use methods now that really slow uh, thing, things things down. Okay, so silting is a is a key thing for us, but please don't think that this is the <laughs> this is the answer. Silting is just a, a little a little bump in the road for many intruders. So with this we we take my past, we add on a little bit, so we take dollar hash one three s two and then we add it on to my past as a string, and then we're going to hash that, okay? So all I've really done is added a few extra characters onto it, uh, and then I've hashed it. But what I've got to do is that I've got to store that uh, with the hash value so that I can actually recover it from them. Okay, so what we have is when we identify our password, our hash values, we have the identification of the type. Uh, we have the salt value that we're using and then we have the, the hash. So I'll just show you, uh, so this is how we would use OpenSSL to be able to generate them. And I'll just show you all the different types of hashing methods around. So let me, let me, let me do a mega hash generate, which probably isn't a very good thing to say, <laughs> but we'll do, a, we'll do a big, we'll try and, and hash um, lots of different types difficult to see that there. So that, uh, I tried to gather every single hash uh, method that's possible. Uh, some of them you'll see are quite slow uh, from, from there. Uh, but it's generating them. Now you saw that SHA-1, SHA-256, really fast. Uh, but when we got to the PBK, <laughs> then, it, then it was a bit slow. So this is, the, this is all the ones I could find. This is my little Python script uh, to be able to do this. Uh, so the thing to notice here, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, just, I'll just grab that. Yeah. Okay, so we pick, off, we pick off maybe one of the values here. Sorry, this resolution's not so good here. Okay, so there's the LM hashes. Uh, they don't actually have any of the dollar signs and, and so on. There's the NT hash. This is for the same, the same word. What we have is we have, for some of the methods, we have a certain number of rounds, okay? So why do you think we have rounds? So in, in bcrypt and pbk, we have rounds. Why do you think we have that? So it's, that's got 535,000 rounds, and it's SHA-256. Why have we? Why would? Why do you think we do that? Slow it down. Slow it down. Okay. So we really want to slug it down. I think sixteen rounds of of <laughs> will pummel you. So in some method, even sixteen or twenty rounds round. So it goes round and 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 hashes it, say five hundred and thirty-five thousand times. Okay which really slows, slows the whole thing down, of course. So do I have to remember, along with the salt, do I have to remember the rounds? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's going to be a nightmare if I lose the rounds. So that's why it's stored in the hash. If it wasn't there, I'd actually have to go and, and keep trying uh, many different, diff different rounds. Okay, so some of them are there. So APR1, can you see APR1? Do you know what that is? Do you know where you'd see that? <coughs> uh, 
that's a Linux uh, password there. Uh, on our Linux, when you look at etc. password, that's the format that you'll actually see. Uh, you'll see there uh, $5 and $6. $5 identifies SHA-256. $6 identifies SHA-5112. If we go right up, MD5 is $1, <coughs> if you see there. And, and, and so on. So the dollar sign, there's the, P, there's the PHP password. So if it's a PHP password method that you use on your system, it's a dollar P uh, then. Okay, so that, so in Bcrypt, Bcrypt, what's the value that we use for Bcrypt? 2A. Okay, so, so that's the, that's it. And if you're interested, here's the, here's the Python code for it. And it's just, a, I've just used, there's different lengths of salt. So I've just used a, a standard salt, salt value and a standard word. And for some, I need a longer, longer salt, or it just won't let me actually do it. And then I've just used this uh, passlib in there to generate each, each, of, the, each of the hash, the hash methods. Hello. <laughs> Okay, so that, that gives us that. And there's a whole lot of other ones that, that we've got. So just don't think that uh, we've got SQL hashes, we've got Cisco picks, uh, and so on. And uh, there's, there's, our, there's our Cisco picks there. And there's our Cisco Type 7 uh, password that we can actually generate. Okay, so Python is the standard, is the standard way that we would typically implement our investigate our hashes, to crack our hashes, uh, and, and, and so on. Why, why do we use Python rather than C Sharp and Java for, for this type of thing? Do you think? Not necessarily. You've got the same libraries in both, kind of. You always get the latest ones in Python. That's, that's why we use it. Uh, You've got to wait for the wrapper. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> but what's the core? What's the core? What's the core of why we use Python? In, in, was it? Interpreter. Yep. It. It. It could be. It. It's less robust uh, than it, and it's easy to change. That's it. But there's a core. There's a core. There's a core advantage that, it, that it's got <laughs> that, that .NET and Java don't have. What's its, what's its real strength? Okay, it runs on lots of platforms. .NET and Java does that too quite well. So that, but that, that's, what, what's its core, core advantage in this space? If I run the same program doing the same thing in C Sharp or .NET, how is it going to be affected? Was that? Oh, the libraries are all the same. They're all using the same libraries, kind of. It's just that there's a wrapper to, to, to dot .NET it or Java it. What's the core, core reason? It's open source. It's open source. Yeah, .NET's kind of open source and Java's kind of open source too. The real advantage is, my God, it's fast. <laughs> It's C++, it's binary. We're going back to the early days of computing. <laughs> We're going back to the days where we just kind of hacked things together. <laughs> so it's really fast because it's C++ and it's core, core uh, machine code. Uh, .NET and Java are running in a framework and they're slow as anything. Okay, so we're going to do any crypto. We're just going to get slugged if we use Java or uh, or, or C sharp from in there. Okay, so so that that's that's what our hashes look like in in real life. Uh, for that, every time we run this, if we've got salt, then then the hash value will obviously change each time. Okay, so remember to have a look to where the dollars are, and to try and uh, and and identify. 
identify from the hash what it actually is. So we can run that space, that's no good. Yeah? Yeah, you should you should never ever ever design your own your own crypto standard at all. Uh, uh, some of them use the uh, the type five, which is a, or, or type one, which is MD five, which is really bad. Uh, the type seven, they try to keep it a secret. Uh, crypto can't be kept a secret for any amount of time. People will steal your code, and one company did steal Cisco's code. I won't say which company that was, but they're a very big company now. Uh, I don't know if it's to do with, what is it? Is it? No, 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 I don't, no, don't say that. <laughs> it wasn't Juniper. <laughs> was it? Did you know, you know something? <laughs> yes. uh -huh. All right, yeah. Well, uh, the <coughs> and, and still source code, possibly. Uh, there was a company, and you can read up on it, I won't tell you here, but there was a company who, who are doing very well on the world stage just now, and the kind of code looked a lot like, I mean, you buy a lot of devices now, it's all Cisco type interfaces that you get anyway, but they're obviously licensing it from, from Cisco. So, so you should never ever create your own crypto standard uh, if it works, and that's why we're using OpenSSL even though OpenSSL got hammered in terms of Heartbleed, it's still kind of there. And uh, if crypto works, then, then leave it. <laughs> and uh, so, so try, try, and keep, try, and keep the, try, try and keep to the standards if, if you can. Uh, they did it with Internet of Things, the smart meters. They created their own crypto, and it was broken <laughs> virtually within months. Uh, the standards agency created a new standard for energy meters uh, with a crypto, and it was weak, and uh, all these energy meters are now uh, vulnerable. Okay, so in the lab today, we'll be using OpenSSL, and we'll have a look at uh, that. So the problem that we have is that uh, we can now have what are called collisions. We can have similar context, and we can have full context. So full context is where a message like hello will give the same... <laughs> the same hash as a message like goodbye, okay? The context would be roughly the same. Rather than having a garbled something, actually it's a full context. And it's not too difficult to create a, a hash a collision there. So this is, you either have a flaw in the protocol. So in the flaw in the protocol is that this, this binary stream, when you hash it, produces the same binary stream. So when Ron designed this, he had a little flaw in there, the methodology didn't quite flip the bits, and I just have to flip a few bits, and it produces uh, the, the, same, the same hash signature. And it happened there, as I said last week, 60 cents, uh, 10 hours on the GPU cloud, and Barry White and uh, James Brown produced the same hashed uh, value. And it didn't work last week, and I know the reason it didn't work is that we needed, we needed 22 people roughly to have 50-50, so it didn't work, <laughs> but it, with a, a, a group of 22 students, you'll have a 50-50 chance of actually getting a, a, the same birthday, which is the same methodology that's used in, in this. It's used in CUDA. When we use Hashcat in the, in the lab today, Hashcat will run quite happily on your Xbox or your PlayStation, and it's optimized for this CUDA architecture. If anybody's doing a project, Based on the dissertation, NVIDIA giveaway. If you have a good research project, we'll give you an NVIDIA card that you can that you can uh, do do these things with. And this is what they did. They produced the same hash for for different uh, values. And then we looked at the, the LM hash. So with LM hash, you've got your SAM database. The SAM database, if the machine is booted up from from the disk, it's unprotected. So the SAM database typically gets popped off the machine and then can actually be analyzed uh, for uh, the, the hashes that we have. Okay, so this is, a, this is, this is the folder here. It's, it's uh, a hive of the, the registry. 
and uh, there's the SAM file there. So uh, the disk is taken off the machine, it's unprotected from there. It then, uh, you pop it off and it becomes a, a hashed a PW dump. Okay, so there's the contents of that. And John the Ripper will typically look at this type of format. It's looking for this type of format for a, a thing there. And we can see there it's, a, it's LMDES and it managed to, to crack the, the password uh, there. Okay, and it's done that by brute force. You can see the range of passwords it's tried to use uh, in there uh, from that. Remember to use your minus minus show to actually show the, the values that have been uh, cracked. So we'll be doing that in the lab today. Off crack is the other one that we, that we often use. So with off crack, <coughs> we preload with a rainbow table. And we've got quite a small rainbow table, but you can get them tens of gigabytes uh, big that you can load up into off crack. Uh, try and avoid graphical interfaces if, if you can, because <laughs> they're obviously quite cumbersome. So John the Ripper is quite useful because it, uh, it gives us a, a thing. And this, was the, this is the kind of state of the art. There's 1.5 tera hashes. It costs you about $5,000. Uh, for our Bitcoin uh, miners. So Bitcoin miners are a bit like producing a hash each time. With the Bitcoin, every single machine on the network uh, that's part of a Bitcoin network has to recompute the whole ledger from the Genesis uh, transaction. So the Genesis transaction is the very first transaction that was ever made on the Bitcoin network. And every 10 minutes, there is a competition to recompute the whole of the ledger of every single Bitcoin that was ever traded. And whoever wins it uh, gets a reward in, in Bitcoins. So there's good money in there, but you've obviously got to build yourself a really great machine to be able to, be, uh, to do that. Okay, so you'll see lots of these GPUs uh, sitting in, in, in the machines. And then we also get what's called a MAC code. So a MAC code, <coughs> is where we have a secret key and we've got to, uh, we take our hash typically it's uh, say, say SHA-5112 and then we encrypt it with our, with our private key we send the hash over and now we need the private key on the other end to be able to, to, be able to read the hash so tell me what the advantage of that actually is Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it, uh, it it identifies that I'm still me. <laughs> Somebody's not hijacked it, and it checks the, the integrity of the, the message. Okay, so the Mac will typically go along with the message, uh, and and it allows us to verify that the person is who they say they are and continues to be. But increasingly, passwords are are pretty bad, and and really. Uh, and need, need to go. Their, their history, they're okay. They're a bit of knowledge that you have, but, but really they're just crazy now to remember 14 digits and have strange quiggly, squiggly characters is, is, is not the way forward. The way forward, though, is, is to, to have what's called a one-time password or a hashed or a, or a hash password. So with a one-time password, what it is, is that I perform, I register my password of Fred, and then I hash it, and that's my first password. I then hash it again, that's my second password. I hash it again, and that's my third. As long as the, as the system here is keeping track of every single time that I log in, is it possible for an intruder to find out what the next password is at that stage? So they would have to have been there when I registered my first password, and then they would have to have known how many times I do it. So this is a, this is a method where we, we just keep hashing and so on. We can also have what's called a time password. So I don't know if, you've, if you have access to any server infrastructure, but, but what can often happen is that you get a password that will be valid for one minute. So I want to log into my servers. I will generate a one-time password 
which will only work for, for one minute, and then after that, it, it won't work. So it's a bit like having a timed, a timed lock uh, there. So I'll just show you that uh, from here. Uh, go to encryption. And what you want is uh, TOP. Uh, RPT. One time password, sorry. Here we go. Okay, so, so here's, a, here's my one time password. So what I've got is, um, is I have a seed for it. Typically it's, it's a number. It's numbers that are easy to remember. And then I create a one time password. And then every single time I create a new one from the original seed, it will give me uh, my, my new password. So I can generate a new seed and every single time it will actually change it when, when I when I use it. So all that's doing is hashing each time that I go that I go through it. My timed password, so I've got a bit of code here and I think I've set it for five seconds. Okay. So I'll generate there one see click 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 ah click 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 yeah. Is that five seconds? Right, we'll count it. Right? So go. One, two, three, four, five. Five. <laughs> five. <laughs> okay, so I've set this one at five seconds, uh, but it could easily, it could easily be at another time uh, from, from, from there. So we could set it for, and Google uses this, I think, for a, their authenticator. There's a Google service now, and you will get one hour to log in. So it's almost like generating your password. You're saying you've got one hour to use this password. If you don't use it, then it won't be valid anymore. So it's like changing the locks on the door, having a little timer on it. Uh, after the same time, then the lock will change and you'll not be able to get back, back in then. Uh, we can also have a hashed one-time password. Okay, so you can see here, we have our counter and we have our original seed from, from there and it will just go through and it'll give us a, a random code. And that is a lot more, that's a lot more secure. To try and guess that, that one-time password uh, within a certain time limit is very difficult as compared to uh, a hashing method. So if you're interested, the Python code is, is there. So that's how much Python code actually needs. Not a lot. Uh, and this one, this one here. Uh, we do it. Yeah, so this, this one here is doing the, the authentication to see if the timed password is actually correct. If I do it again after four seconds in this case, then it won't allow me, uh, it won't see it's actually true. We can do the same with a timestamp. So when, when, you, when you went... Let's say you went to a lawyer and, and you've invented something new. And the standard way that you actually prove that you did it is that you, you, you send your invention to a lawyer, they sign it and they put it into a safe. And then if somebody says that you didn't do it, then you pull out the document and you look at the signature and you open the letter. And that's a, that's a crazy world. <laughs> that really doesn't prove anything. We can create what's called a... a, a a timestamp, a verified timestamp for data. So if I want to make sure that you did send this message at this time, uh, then I can produce a, a, a hash of it. And, and a timestamp. So this uses a standard protocol. Okay, so there's the, there's the encoded message. So this, this is almost 100% secure. If I... If I uh, store that, then that verifies that I created the, the word hello at, 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 at that time. That is using a hash signature, and it also uses a, 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 a timestamp. Tell me the problem with this type of protocol. The one problem with this type of protocol...
Time zone is exactly the problem. Uh, so time zones and different clocks on different machines. So if it, if it matters whether it was it was two or seconds after uh, something, uh, because events really matter. Did that event happen for that one? Uh, but there are time servers on the internet that are that are trusted and uh, there. But this method allows us to take our data and produce a timestamp, which is which is verified uh, on on the system. Okay, give us the there's the. There's the code. Okay, so, so, uh, let's not try and find it by there. Okay, so our, our hashing methods, we can, <coughs> and more and more, we're moving towards pin, pin numbers. We're using towards numbers that are quite simple, easy to remember. Six three nine four, then a big long phrase for for your password. Uh, and more and more, we're moving towards biometrics as a form of uh, uh, as a form of of, authentic of authentication too. Okay, so that's that's our that's our one time our one time passwords. I give you a heads up on on other ones. Uh, there are ones that are non non crypto. Uh, Non-crypto ones are really fast. So if you've got an embedded system, a really simple device, then you're not going to be implementing complex crypto. So there are other, there are other ones around, such as FMV and Murmur. The fastest one I think just now is is XX Hash. It's a Google one. Uh, I think it's been benchmarked at ten. 10 gigahashes a second or so, which is about 10 times faster than, uh, than, than, than SHA. But these ones are non-crypto uh, in, in there. So Murmur is, is a non-crypto, uh, and it's good, good for, for CPU. FNV is another one in there. Uh, the area that we've been working a lot in is is in secret shares. So in RSA, does anybody know what the S is for? Who's, who's the S? Shamir. 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 So Shamir is the big hero of, of ours. Uh, Shamir broke the one of the first public key methods, uh, Merkel, uh, uh, Merkel Hellman uh, method that looked like it was going to succeed. He, he cracked he cracked it. And uh, so he did, he did a lot of the kind of core stuff in this area. But there we've been working in is that, uh, let, let, let's say we've got a secret. And the secret is, um, is uh, the, 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 the gradient of a straight line. So the gradient of a straight line is, well, well, I know it's not the case here, is three. So Shamir said that if I want to keep that secret, I have a point, and you have a point. So tell me why that keeps that keeps a secret. Yeah. Okay. Without without the two points, you can't actually you can't draw the straight line uh, there. So then they said, uh, uh, let let's. Let's say we've got three people together, and let's say we want any two from three. So any two from three is that is that we could have three points, and is it possible for any two people to come together and draw the, the straight line? Yeah. Only if it's a straight line. But then we can have more complicated, so that's what a quadratic equation, I forget, looks, looks like, looks a bit bad. <laughs> A quadratic equation uh, is something like x squared plus bx and things. So actually, if we want to store a value of a, then we actually need three people to come together to actually draw the quadratic equation uh, and, and make it fit. So this was the method that uh, Shamir used to be able to create uh, secret, secret shares. And what we end up is that, is that we take the message 
This is, this is the only method that you'll use, is, which is 100% secure in any of, the, any of the modules that you do. <laughs> this is 100% secure. It's impossible to find out the equation of the straight line without you coming together with, with another uh, point, okay? Everything else that we do always has the opportunity to be cracked. This is 100% uh, uh, secure uh, from it. So let's, let's actually have a look at, at that. Uh, I think it's in Shamir. Oh, good, I've crashed my website. That's good. So just let me, let me reboot my website. Uh, just let me, let me restart my website. If you see that, then just tell me and, and I'll reboot at any time. Good old Microsoft Windows. <laughs> Microsoft Windows Server, IIS, well done. So it's just, uh, just um, it's probably Splunk that did it. Right, so just starting back there. Okay, so, so here we go. So let's go for five shares and any three, any three shares can come together and rebuild the message as it is. It's impossible for two shares to come together it needs to be at least three. Okay, so we define that as the threshold and we define the number of shares. Uh, so we've been building whole cloud systems with this, with this method. So there, there is our five shares. And what I've done is I've picked off three of them to be able to build them back again. So some, somebody, give me, somebody give me a message to just show there's no smoke and mirrors here. Give me a message. Anything. <laughs> What is it? Good morning. Good. I'll just do good, okay? All right. Okay. All right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick off these shares, okay? I'm going to copy them. And I've got a decoder there. Okay. And, oh, that's good. It's even got them there ready for me, has it? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. So I'm pasting the back end. I promise this is a, this is a live demo if it, if it doesn't go well. Please don't. Please don't, uh, don't have a go to the method, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> right. What I've, what I've implemented there is I tried just one of the shares, and it gives garbled. And I tried two of the shares. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. I've tried two of the shares, and it gives garbled, and I bring three shares together. So I promise that's a, that's a real live demo. What we've been implementing in it is that we're quite worried that the east coast of the US uh, has a power outage and all of your great Amazon uh, web services and all your whole infrastructure could, could, could crash and it can't happen. So we've been looking at how you stripe data across clouds and keep security. So is it possible for me to use three clouds, Azure, Amazon and Google, to take my data and to put a share into each of them and then do an any two from three? which means that Google could crash or could get hacked. <coughs> I go down, I can still recover uh, the data by bringing the two together. It's a bit like RAID. Does anybody know the best RAID that you can get, when the best uh, disk RAID that you implement on a system? We, we use it. What's the best, uh, any idea the best RAID that you have on your disk? It's 10, so 10 is the best. Uh, because you can you can have failure on disks and it doesn't affect the performance. RAID five is the next one, uh, but the performance goes when you lose a disk. So it's a bit like a bit like that. So that that's our that's uh, Shamir Shamir method uh, from there. So what we'll do is we'll have a break for five minutes and then we'll do some lovely digital certificate.